Good morning, senior school. Today we're going to be diving deeper into four-part harmony. And at the end of this video, I'm going to show you an example of four-part harmony from a hymn. And I'm also going to show you an example of a, a project example that you could look at as inspiration for your future theory project that is coming up. In our Manage Back, where you clicked on the link for this video, I also included the Word document you will need to read in order to understand exactly what I require of you for this project. Okay, here we go. The first thing we're going to talk about today is voicing chords. This is where we take those block chord positions, root chord positions that I showed you last week, and we kind of blow them up into a grand staff like you would see on piano music. The type of voicings we're going to be using are more commonly used for what I would describe as singing music or songs, like a hymn. And I'll show you an example of that in a little while. So we will often compose notes of a chord in numerous ways in order to vary its sound. So this process, like I said before, is called voicing. To demonstrate this, we'll voice an F major chord. So the first one you're going to look at here is an F major chord in root position. That's something you've seen and I've shown you already. F A C makes it major. Um, so notice that we can arrange these notes in any order we like as long as F, A, and C are used and as long as F is the lowest note. See there's lots of different ways to use it and if you notice F is always the lowest note in the bass clef. Sometimes we have three notes in the bass clef and one note in the treble clef. Sometimes we have three in the treble clef and one in the bass but often and always F needs to be at the bottom. So let's go ahead and listen to what these sound like. As you can hear, there's lots of different qualities depending on where the note is. Next, we're going to voice an F major triad in first inversion. We talked about inversions last week as well. If you don't remember everything about inversions, just remember that inversions are created when the bass note or the lowest note is either the third or the fifth of a chord rather than the first. So you can see in this particular example, the third, the A of the F major triad, is in the bottom, it's the bass, it's the lowest sound, which means that our chord is in first inversion. And here it is blown up all across the staff. We have lots of different examples, but our one rule we said was we want to make sure that A is the bottom note because it's in first inversion. So we'll go ahead and listen to these. Quite a different sound than when we had it in root position. All right, lastly, we're going to voice it in second inversion, which is where the third of the chord, in this case a C, is the root note or the bottom note, the bass note, the lowest sound. Process is the same, we just need to make sure that our C is the lowest note. And we'll listen to these last examples. And that's basically it for chord voicing. Uh, we're going to explore what that looks like though when we use different chords rather than just uh, an F major triad and just use the one chord. We're going to see what it looks like when we move through the chord progressions we also talked about last week. Next thing we're going to talk about is root motion, which is the movement from one chord's root or its bottom note to another chord's root. Okay, so to demonstrate root motion, we're going to use the one and the four. If you look, or sorry, the one and the six. You can see that in C major we have a one chord, which is major, C, C, E, and G. We've got all four of the notes in there, but we made sure to have the bottom note be a C. And it is moving down one, two, to the six. The six chord in the key of C, remember, is A minor, so it's going to have A, C, E, and A. We've got all the chords in there. So the root of the one chord in C major is C. The root of the six chord in C is A. It's an A minor triad. Therefore, the root motion between them is down a third. Um, so we're not going to talk about it being up a sixth, but that is also another way you could describe it. However, because we went down in pitch rather than up to the A, it is down a third. Now we're going to do another example, the four to the five. The four chord in the key of C is F major. So the root is going to be an F. You can see all the notes are there. F, C, F, a, F, A, C, all show up. 
and the root of the second chord, a G major triad, is G. The 5 in the key of C is a G major chord. So you'll notice that there wasn't much motion. F to G is a smaller distance, which is only up a second. So that motion is smaller and easier to do because it's just a short distance. And lastly, well, maybe we'll do the next one will be a one chord in first inversion going to a root position five. Okay, so we know that the one chord in first position means the third is going to be on the bottom. In this case, the E. The root is a C. Since it's inverted, the root is not the lowest note. And the root of the second chord is a G, which means that we're going up a fifth or down a fourth because we're moving root to root, remember. So a circle progression occurs when, ro when root motion is equal to up a fourth or down a fifth. This is popular in lots of pieces. One example is Pachelbel's Canon. Uh, it's a good example of circle progression. So the 1 is going to the 4, 5 is going down to the 1. That's all you need to pay attention to. And as long as you fill in the other notes above it in the chord, you'll be fine. So both 1 to 4 and, and 2 to 5 are circle progressions, up a 4th and down a 5th. And this one is also the same. 3 to 6 and 4 to diminished 7 are also circle progressions. So we're going to start and work out these circle progressions for ourselves in a major scale. We're going to start with 1. 1 goes to 4, down a 5th. 4 goes to 7, up a 4th. You're going to notice it's like a step ladder. Down a 5th, up a 4th. 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 And therefore we have our progression. So the major scale circle progression is 1, 4, 7, 3, 6, 2, 5, 1. And this is not another great example of a progression that doesn't necessarily follow the chord progressions we looked at before, but still sounds nice, and you might recognize this progression. Sounds very final, ends in a cadence that we're going to talk about later. So let's look at it now, but this time for the minor scale. Same idea. 1 goes to 4, 4 goes to uh, 7, which is now major. 7 goes to 3, down a 5th, up a 4, down a, third, down a 5, up a 4th, down a 5th, and we're at the end. So the minor scale progression is a little different because our, some of our chords are now major and some of them are now minor. And here's what this one sounds like. Nice. So here is a chart that displays circle progressions for both. If you're running out of progression ideas on your project, you're welcome to come here and take a look to see which ones progress to which well. Okay, so this is an example of some circle progressions. Speaking of, of progressions, I really quickly wanted to just point this one out to you guys again. Remember, this is the chart we used to move through um, common chord progressions. The arrows pointing to what chords go to which one. So 5 and 7 go to 1, 2 and 4 go to 5 and 7, 6 goes to 2 and 4, 3 goes to 6, and 1 can go anywhere. So 1 is a great way to figure out a good progression. So here's the example I showed you earlier. 1 can go to 6. Great. So now we look at our chart. Where is 6? Ah, there it is. 6 can go to either 2 or 4. So we're going to choose 4. Now we can choose either 5 or 7. So let's go with 5, and then 5 finally takes us back to 1. We got an easy peasy 5 chord progression. So here's what that sounds like. Very simple to do, very easy to do, okay? So next we're going to talk about phrases and cadences, which are how we're going to be ending our song. Since your song you'll be composing for me is going to have four measures, and each measure is going to have two chords in it, I'll show you an example in a minute, that means you're going to have four chords in one phrase and four chords in another. So you're going to be giving me two different examples of cadences and two phrases total. So I'll show you what that means. A phrase is a series of notes that sound complete even when played apart from the main song. So we're going to use this musical example to demonstrate that. First, I'm going to play the first two measures and notice how they don't sound very complete. Obviously that melody wants to go somewhere. It doesn't want to end on that B flat. It wants to head somewhere. Now we're going to play the first four measures and they sound a little bit more complete. You 
could end it there. It wouldn't be very interesting, but it sounds complete. I challenge you, too, to look at your band music and look through some of those tunes. Play some of those things four measures at a time. A lot of the times, the reason we rehearse in band and we practice things four measures at a time is because those are the phrases of the song, and it's important to understand how the phrases are separate from the rest of the piece. Okay? Those measures could be considered a phrase. Now we're going to play the final four measures, fifth through eighth. Due to their complete sound, they also form a phrase. So we have eight measures, total of two phrases. Four measures often makes a phrase. Before moving to the next section, though, we're going to just go ahead and add some of these chords in. So the piano is going to play the chords and the melody at the same time so you can hear what it sounds like. Doesn't that sound better? A melody by itself is not complete. It needs to have chords. So, a cadence. Let's talk about cadences. Cadences are two chord progressions that occur at the end of the phrase. For example, one to five in the top line and five to one in the bottom line. If a phrase ends with a five, it's called a half cadence. Half cadences sound good, but they're not totally complete. Sometimes you need to change or add more to the music to find a complete sound. So we're going to listen to those again and listen for that half cadence. You could almost end there, but the music needs more to it. Most people will hear a half cadence as sounding incomplete. Therefore, composers usually follow them with a phrase, these bottom four measures, ending in an authentic cadence. An authentic cadence occurs whenever you go from a five or seven to a one, or a minor one if it's a minor uh, scale. So listen to this example and hear how complete it is. Very nice. Very nice. I had a teacher in college who used to always say, quite nice. That's quite nice. Whenever we ended with a proper cadence in our compositions, he'd say, that's quite nice. So authentic cadences are also classified as two different kinds. We have perfect cadences and imperfect authentic cadences. So for it to be a perfect cadence, it has to meet three specific criteria. First, it's got to go from a 5 to a 1, not a 7 to a 1. Second, both chords need to be in root position, meaning the bass note is the name of the chord. So we've got a G at the bottom and a C at the bottom because we're going from a G major to a C major. And finally, the highest note of the 1 chord must be the same as its root. So for this chord, it's a C, E, G chord, C major, the top note then, the fourth note, the highest note needs to also be a C. So this is a perfect authentic cadence because it meets all the criteria. Next, we have imperfect authentic cadences, which, fall, which uh, fail to meet the requirements. They just one of those things it has to miss, although it could miss more. Basically, if you end at a 1 and you go from a 5 to a 7, you're going to have an imperfect, imperfect authentic cadence. So these cadences are all imperfect due to a couple different reasons. The first is that we're going from a 7 instead of a 5. That's imperfect. Not bad. Imperfect doesn't mean bad. It just means it's not right. In the second example, one of the chords is not in root position. So this 5 is in first inversion because there is a um, B on the bottom. It's not a G, right? So it's, that is also an example of an imperfect authentic case. And in the third example, the highest note is a G, not a C. So it is also imperfect. So in addition to authentic and half cadences, remember half cadences are 1 to 5, and authentic cadences are either 5 or 7 to 1, we also have two other kinds. This is called a plagal cadence, which is kind of a funny word, but that's whenever we go from a 4 or a minor 4 to a 1 or a minor 1. So listen to this plagal cadence. Not a bad cadence. Doesn't sound incomplete, sounds final, but it's a little bit different than the authentic cadences were. If a phrase ends with a five, going to a chord other than one, it's a deceptive cadence. So five to anything but a one is deceptive. It's often used in place of an authentic cadence because it likes to play with the uh, listener's expectations. 
So recall the musical example we used at the beginning. Instead of ending with a 1, we're going to end with a minor 6. So listen to this now that we have a deceptive case. Quite different. So it deceives you. It's like a tease, right? Sometimes composers will end songs there and sometimes they'll keep them going. But that is an example of a deceptive case. So here's the chart. If you want to take a picture of it, write it down, copy it, I would suggest doing that so you have it in your brain. And uh, that'll tell you different types of cadences you can end your phrases with. And lastly, we're going to analyze a piece of music called O Canada, which is the national anthem of Canada. <laughs> And then we're going to look at some Muse score examples for your project. So being able to analyze the notes and chords of a song is a major part of music theory and music intelligence in general. So in this analysis, we will be looking at the first four measures of O Canada, the National Anthem of Canada. The first step um, to, anal to analysis is to determine the key. So since the key signature contains three fat flats, we have two possibilities. It could either be a minor key or a major key. We first will figure out the major key though. We find the second to last flat. It's in the E flat spot, which means that this is the E key of E flat major, which is also the same as C minor. Um, and then to kind of figure out what key we might be in, it's, it's, you can look at the notes in the first chord. So in this first chord, we've got E flat, B flat, E flat, and G. That tells me because there's so many E flats and the fact that it's an E flat major chord, that's probably a major triad which means this is probably the one, and which means we're also most likely in the key of E-flat because of that. The second chord contains a D, B-flat, F, and another B-flat at the top. It's a B-flat major triad, but um, the D is on the bottom, which means instead of being a root position 5, we have a 5 in first inversion. This chord is identical to the one before, so we can just leave the 5-6 underneath it. Now this one's a little more simple. We can figure out the notes. We've got C, G, C, and E flat, which means we have a C minor chord. And in the key of E flat, that is the six. So the second chord after that contains a B flat major triad in root position. And so we just put a five, not a five, six. Next, we've got a one chord. If you look at the notes, E flat, B flat, E flat, and G. So it's an E flat major triad. Thus, it is another one chord. The second chord contains C, A-flat, E-flat, and A-flat. So this is an A-flat major triad. We know that because of the notes. But because C is in the root position, we've got a 4 in uh, first inversion. And this next chord contains G, G, E-flat, and B-flat, which is an E-flat major triad again. But this time we've got G on the bottom, so it's in first inversion. And the fourth chord contains A-flat, C, E-flat, and C, which is another A-flat major triad. And notice that it is now in root position. And we're going from a 4 to a 5. So the final measure contains a B flat, B flat, D, and F, which is a B flat in B flat major triad. And thus we're ending with a 5 chord. And if you can guess what cadence that is, too, since we can go back to our cadence chart and we know that we're going from any chord to a 5, which means that we are looking at a half cadence at the end. So let's go ahead and listen to the first four measures of O Canada hearing those chord progressions. Since it's a half cadence, can you hear how it still has more to say? There's more to the music than just these first four measures. But that is one example of how we can look at phrases in a piece of music like O Canada. Okay, the last thing I wanted to do is show you two examples. This first example is actually a hymn called Holy, Holy, Holy. This is from a hymnal that is at my house, and I just opened it up and took a look at it, and I copied it out in the key of D major because there's two sharps, and so we can take a look and do a little quick mini analysis of this on our own. So first let's listen to it though. So as you look at this and you start thinking about the way that the chords are voiced and the progressions, you start to think more about how notes go from one note to the other. So the, a good first step to do to take is to write down all your root notes. So D, D, B flat, B flat, A flat, 
sorry, B, B, A, D. So we're going 1, 1, D to B is D, E, F, G, A, B. That's a 6 chord. We've got B, D, F. That's a B, D, F sharp is a B minor chord. So it's 1, 1, 6, 6. And then we've got 5 because we're going A, E, C, A. That's a 5 chord. Back to 1. And if you look at it, we almost have an example of a of a perfect cadence. However, so we're going from five to one, so it's a definitely an inauthentic cadence, but it's imperfect because the highest note is not also a D, right? If this had been flipped up here instead, we would have a, an example of a perfect cadence, but because we don't have that, it's a five to one imperfect cadence. So that's the first two measures, which in its, in its own is almost a phrase. Take a listen to that. Hear that? It could end right there and probably sound okay. Now the next couple of chords are a little more complicated, but look at the different voices. See how they're going up step by step? We want to write our music so that it's easy for singers to sing it. It is easier for a singer to sing in stepwise motion like that than it is to sing jumping around a bunch of intervals and huge leaps. Now you might be saying, well, there's one big leap down here. There is. G but it's going from G, a low G, to a high G, which is not actually as hard to sing because it's an octave. So singing a low G to a high G is a little simpler than maybe singing a G to a C, okay? So that's an example in a hymnal of how we can use chord progressions and then use moving notes to kind of create a good example of what we want. And if you'll notice, D, D, F, A, D, F, D, F, A, D, A, D, F, we end with a one chord again, and we're going to that from a G, C, E, B. Hmm, that's a tricky one. That's a very tricky chord. We've got G, we've got C, we've got E, and we've got B. So what could that be? Well, most likely it's a C chord, but it's got some extra notions in it. So we've got C, E, G, and then it's got the B on top, which means it's actually a C chord a C seventh chord. And it's a C diminished chord as well because C is the seventh scale degree of the key of E. This is probably too much information for you, but I want you guys to hear kind of how this process works so that when you write your own music, you can think through it. So when we get to this chord, listen to it as it goes into the one. So we're going from a seven to a one, which means we're ending again in an authentic case. It's not perfect though, it's imperfect because we're going from seven to one. Okay guys, last example I'm going to show you is the one I wrote. It took me about five minutes to do this. I want you to listen to it first. I did all of it in root position, so it would be easy to see. One, C. Uh, six, A. F, four. G, five. 5, 6, 7, C, 1. So there's my first example of a cadence. I did 1, 6, 4, 5, which is a half cadence. Then I've got 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, back to a 1. So I have 2, I've got a half cadence in this measure, and then I've got an imperfect authentic cadence in this measure for a couple of reasons. The first reason being I went from a 7 to a 1. The second reason being my highest note is not a C, it's an E. So listen to that again. The reason this, this flows so nicely is I was very conscious. I wanted to move my notes as little as possible. You'll notice, except in the bass line, the bottom notes, I don't have very big leaps. Okay, I've got a bit of a leap here from an E to an A, but that's about it. I tried to keep the notes as close as I could to each other because that makes it easier for the singers to sing. Okay, guys, that's my example I wanted to show you. Obviously, if you try to copy that, I will notice, <laughs> so you have to make your own. I'm going to have a Word document in the assignment so that you can read to understand more about what you're supposed to do. And don't forget, today we're having our Zoom meeting. All right, guys, good luck and enjoy the rest of your day.